Hello, everybody. I'm Kenneth Copeland, and this is the Believer's Voice of Victory broadcast. Praise God. I'll tell you, what a time to have faith in God. Amen. Because, thank you, Father. Yes, sir, I see that. Those that have faith in God have victory in God. And He always gives us the victory. He always causes us to triumph. Praise God. We've got Him in the here and now. We've got Him in the short thing, and we've got him in the long thing, and we've got him throughout eternity. Praise God. Father, we thank you today for your word, and we give you praise and honor for it. We receive your presence among us in Jesus' name. Amen. Join me in welcoming David Barton to this broadcast. Hey, David, Ken. praise God. I, you know, I know you one of the busiest men walking on the earth. <laughs> kind of like you. I appreciate you coming here and taking time to, My pleasure. to spend with us together in the, in the Word. Uh, David, let's go over to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Um, in the 14th verse, if my people, which are called by my name. Now, uh, here, well, let's, let's read through this whole verse. Scripture. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then will I, or, or then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Now, it's important to take hold. I will heal their land. So it's God's will to heal the land. But now I want you to see something in this. He said, if my people called by my name will do this. He's not talking about the whole That's land. Right. He's talking about his people. If my people will wake up. That's right. And if, if they'll listen to me and do what I tell them to do, mm -hmm. I will heal the land. Mm -hmm. Now, let's go over to the book of Isaiah and let's see what God's pattern is for healing the land. And in the first chapter of the book of Isaiah, you see beginning with the 18th verse, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. God has said, now, now, now let's, let's talk about this and let's think this through. But now he's not saying for you to do that. He said, you come reason with me because when you get through hearing me, that's what's reasonable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Amen. That's right. that's right. Though your sins be as scarlet. Now, there are people that are saying the sins of the United States as a government, as a nation, are so scarlet they can never be changed. But now, that's not what he said here. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And though they be red like crimson, they will be as wool. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you'll be devoured with a sword for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Yeah, but now, Brother Copeland, now, wait a minute. He's, he's, here he's talking about, uh, about people. This is a personal thing. Well, now, wait a minute. Look at the next verse. Now is the faithful city becomes a harlot. It was full of judgment, righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. Your silver has become dro gro dross. Your wine mixed with water. Your princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loves gifts. Everybody's wanting a bribe. They all got their hand out. They can be bought. Some can be bought for as cheap as a tax exempt status. Yeah. Ooh. And follow after rewards. 
They judge not the fatherless, neither doth the cause of the widow come unto them. Therefore saith the Lord God of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, Ah, I will ease me of mine adversaries and avenge me of mine enemies. I'll turn my hand upon you and purely purge away your dross. I'll take away your, sin, your tin. I'll restore your judges as at the first and your counselors as at the beginning. Afterward, you shall be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Now here God is talking about his people and the, the government in which they live, the environment which governs whether they serve God in peace or serve God under the, under the threat of the hammer. Good government or bad government. That's, all, that's been a story ever since, ever since the Tower of Babel. I mean, it, it's been functioning all this time. But now notice what he said. If you do what I tell you to do, we'll change the judges. Now, I wonder why he didn't start with the presidents or the prime ministers. Why did he start with the judges? Because judges affect everything yeah. we do. There is some judge has to do with your driver's license, man. Yeah, that's <laughs> I right. mean, it, uh, there's everybody is affected by a judge yeah. one day or another, all the time somehow, and you you see t terrible things happening where where some just recently some guy just raped this little girl over and over and over and over and over and over again, and they finally caught him and they. And he convicted him, and he went up in front of a judge, and he gave him a year. Yeah, yeah. See, one of the things from a Christian standpoint, I'll, I'll tell you an attitude that every Christian has to adopt, and that is if the Word of God says it, you just buy it right there at that point in time. A lot of people get into a conflict between what they consider to be science and the Bible. Let me tell you, science always catches up to the Bible eventually. Oh, I've watched science in my lifetime reverse itself on a number of oh, positions. Yeah, I have too. And it always eventually catches up to what the Bible is. So you have to take the Bible as your first default position. If God said it, that's just the way it is. He made it. He knows how it works. He knows what it'll take. He says that righteousness exalts a nation, sins are reproached to any people. He says that righteousness is what lifts you up. And then he tells Isaiah over here, that your righteousness is determined by the judges in your land. Now, if we just back off a little bit and say, how does God measure righteousness for a nation? He, and now, for a believer, he measures righteousness by the blood of Jesus Christ. If we've been washed with the blood of Christ, that's what he sees. He sees Christ. That's how we're measured. That's not how he measures nations. When he looks at nations, he measures their public policies. He looks at what they do, and can he bless, or does he have to oppose that policy? And, and this way, all the way through, with Ahab and Jezebel, when they had wicked policies, the whole nation without rain for three and a half years. You get David in there with righteous policies, so the nation prospers, they've got peace, they've got prosperity, their enemies are at peace with them. It, it all depends on your policies. And so when you look at policies, if we just back off from God's standpoint and say, can God bless a policy that kills His children before or as they're being born. No way. That's shedding of innocent blood. We know that from way back to the beginning. You shed innocent blood, curse will be on the land. Can God bless a policy that says, we know you said marriage is between a man and a woman, but we think you're crazy. We think it's different. He's not going to bless that policy. Can, can he bless a policy where he says, suffer the little children coming to me? And we say, oh no, at school, the kids can't come into him. There's no way he's going to bless that policy. Well, that means the only time he can deal with that policy is right then when it's enacted because nations do not live in the future. So when you make a policy decision, right then God has to deal with it. Now, you and I, we'll, we deal with the consequences now, but he's also going to deal with us in the future based on, on, on what we do. We know that from Revelation, but not nations. Nations only have right now to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. when you look at these decisions that are righteousness, we have not had... We have not had a state in this United States by the legislative bodies say, we don't want kids to pray at football game or in schools. We don't kid, want kids to mention God. We don't want kids to learn about Him. But our judges have told us that. Now, can He bless that policy? No. 
but the judges are the ones who made it. Judges are the ones who gave us abortion on demand. That wasn't legislatures. Judges are the ones who said we have to do homosexual marriage. Legislatures have now jumped in because judges said we had to do it. You look at every decision of righteousness in this land, it comes back to the judges. It doesn't come back to the legislature. It doesn't come to the House, the Senate, or the President. It comes to the judges. And so God did that. And, and that's why from a biblical standpoint, I mean, what, what he says to judges is so powerful. You, you go to Second Chronicles uh, 19, verses 6 and 7. I just want to read some of the verses where God talks to judges. Second Chronicles 19, uh, verses 6 and 7. Uh, this is in the middle of a revival, by the way. Jehoshaphat is restoring the land, getting God back in the center of what's happening. And Jehoshaphat set judges land, uh, this is verse 5, set judges land throughout all the fence cities of Judah, city by city. And he said to the judges, take heed for what you do. You do not judge for man, but for the Lord who is with you in judgment. Therefore, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take heed and do it, and let there be no iniquity with the Lord our God, and respect the person who taking it. Judges, understand, you're sitting in the place of God when you make a decision. You make the same decision he would make. If you want God to bless your land, you better have a judge that makes the same, because you're judging in the, in the state of God. You get over to Psalms, chapter 2 of Psalms, verses, uh, Psalms chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. He deals with judges again. And in Psalms chapter 2, verses 10 through 12, Be wise, therefore, O you kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, S-O-N, lest he be angry and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but eluded. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. He's talking to judges. He said, judges, you better embrace the Son. You better serve the Lord. You make your decisions on that basis. You, you do what God wants done because you're minister. That's why three times in Romans 13, twice in verse 4, once in verse 6, he says that those that are in civil government are ministers of God. Mm -hmm. they, yeah. they rule yeah. in that position. And, and so for us as as believers, if we want our land to be blessed, it won't be blessed without righteousness. And if you want righteousness, it comes to the judges. It's the only way you're going to get it. So as we're coming up with elections about to come on us, for a Christian, for any biblical person, we should step back and say, all right, what can I do in this election that will improve the judiciary? What can I do that will improve the judges? Because that's where righteousness comes from. And the answer to that is the Senate. The Senate is what determines the judge. They're the ones that confirm or reject judges. They have the final say on whether the judges go on the court or off the court. And so, oh, I, you know, I don't like voting. I don't want to get involved. Well, if you want righteousness in the land, you better get involved. And you better look at the Senate races in your state, and you better figure out which of these persons running for Senate is going to give you the best set of judges. Because if you want God to restore the land, you got to start with judges, and that's a key to it. Now, if you want God then to restore or and protect your household yeah, and your workplace right. and so and and so forth then you need to do yeah. what we are responsible for doing in this country because God has given us the gift That's right. of being able to listen to him and choose those judges. You know, Other the, countries don't have that. They don't get that choice. They don't get they that do choice. They do not get we that do, choice. And we're going to have to stand before him and answer for just sitting there in the living room That's and right. arguing with the television and not voting or vote for some other reason thinking, what did he say about all those that won't reward? Well, yeah. I'm Brother Copeland. I'm not taking a bribe. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. They're bribing you with things like health care. They're bribing you with, with wages and so forth, and you vote for somebody yeah. for that reason, yeah. knowing they're on the wrong side of everything That's God right. said. You see, this, the verse you started with has so... I never thought about it before. That's taking a bribe. It is taking a bribe. It's bribery. And, and you hit it, too. You can be bought as simply as a 501c3 tax yeah. exemption. Whoa. Whoa. Yeah. Can, you just, can now. you just hear the Apostle Paul saying, Lord, now, wait a minute. I, you know, I can't preach that. They'll take my tax exemption away from me. Well, I, I, you, do you, Come on. you remember the biblical precedent for that because Elijah was just about to confront Ahab and Jezebel. He was just about to tell them the working policies. He was just about to say, eminent domain. You took Naboth's vineyard. You, the government took private property. You can't. He was just about to go through that policies. And fortunately, at the last minute, he remembered his 501c3 tax exemption and kept his mouth shut. And fortunately, Elijah didn't say anything. That, not, no way. 
You, you think Elijah's going to back off over that? And, and Nathan and Gad, they're just about to get to David and say, David, thou art the man. What you did, Bathsheba, what you did, that, and fortunately, they remembered their 501c3 tax exemption, and they said nothing about it. I don't think I remember that anywhere in the no, Bible. No, no, no. I think I remember God's ministers always, first and foremost, confronted civil authorities. That's what God had. Yes, Even sir. Jesus called Herod an old fox. He called yes, out the, 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 the leaders, civil leaders, as whitewashed sepulchers. I don't know that many leaders today, Christian leaders, would have the courage to do what Jesus did, and yet we claim to be following him. So you're right, bribes. We can be bought for really cheap sometimes, and we've got to have more courage than that. The, the verse you started with, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, yeah, yeah, is yeah. such a, a, it has so many good promises. God says, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive your sin. I will hear your land. Amen. We love that. The biggest problem with this verse is the biggest word in the Bible. It's the two-letter word, if. Mm -hmm, he says, mm -hmm. I will do that if. Here's if. the deal. I'll, I'll do it. If, if my people will do some things. And he just goes through what has to be done. You humble yourselves. You pray. You turn from your wicked ways. Uh, part of turning from our wicked ways is sitting on our thumbs and keeping our mouth shut. And if we're not willing to engage and get off our, get out of our chairs and open our mouth and start speaking things, he's not going to heal the land. He's waiting on us. We're not waiting on him to heal the land. He's waiting on us. You know, I'm uh, just, ever since the first time I heard it, it'll come up in my thinking. It'll, it'll just, and when it does, it, it, it it's like, uh, it, it has a startling effect on me. I heard my spiritual father, Oral Roberts, say back when I was a student there at ORU, 47 years ago, mm. he said, whatever you compromise to keep, you will eventually lose it. Yeah, that's right. And I'm thinking, well, yeah, thinking about that tax-exempt status, thinking yeah. about... Well, you know, I'm, I mean, I could lose my job over this. Yeah. And and you back away and do and say what you know yeah. is displeasing to the, the Word of God, and you know you're not right in doing it, mm -hmm. you will lose it. Well, and one of the things that, that goes with that is the perspective we have, because we live in a culture right now where we're told, that as Christians, we need to be likable. People need to get along with us. We don't need to offend other people. We need to be tolerant. We need to be biblical. We don't need to be tolerant. The, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, is what we're told in Proverbs. That's not being tolerant. Jesus wasn't tolerant when he walked in the temple and said, you guys are doing wrong. This is supposed to be a house of prayer. You made a house of commerce. Look at this whip I put together. And, and, and then he preached in there all day. Yeah. He didn't just scatter them out. That's right. He took he a text, it. That's right. and the scripture said he preached till evening came. That's right. And that's, that's the, and it wasn't easy preaching because you remember his disciples, he turned and said, well, everybody else has left me. You guys are going to leave yeah, me? Yeah, well, and they <laughs> said, where could where we, go? we go? Well, they thought about it, didn't they? They, they th couldn't figure out anywhere to and go. And it was because his teachings were so hard. But see, that's, oh if we show that kind of courage, God shows up when you show courage. If you'll stand up and get a backbone, God's there to heal the land. Yeah. But he's, he's waiting on us, and that's what we have to do. We have to shake ourselves out of the slumber and lethargy. We have to shake ourselves out of our complacency and say, I don't care if anybody else does or not. I may be the only one, but I can save the land with God, and I'm going to be the one to do it. Get that attitude. Go charging into it. You know, attack the gates of hell with a water pistol because they can't stand up to it. There's no way if we'll do it. He's just waiting on us to do something. That's it, really. Mm -hmm. uh, David, let's go over to the sixth chapter of Ephesians. There is something here that is, is, is so very, very important to know about these things. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness, where they don't rule us. Yeah. And no born-again child of God has any business yielding to them. Yeah, that's right. 
That's right. Against spiritual wickedness in high places. Those spiritual, wicked spirits in high places are the ones that govern uh, or, or attempt to govern nations. Mm -hmm. Now, consider this. When we're talking about God blessing, that blessing is already here. Yeah. When we're talking about the curse, that curse is already here. Mm -hmm. Our choices determine yeah. whether we are blessed That's or right. cursed. Now, when we install people that relax the thing that activates the curse, which is sin, That's which right. is anything that God says won't work. That's right. And when we, when we put people in there, now think about this. Um, there are people who make it easy to sin. There are people who make it hard that's to sin. Right. And that's part of our job, make it hard to sin. That's right. And when you do, this whole atmosphere locks strong into the blessing, makes it hard to sin. That's right. But it blesses the people when that's the exactly righteous right. rule. That's right. But now when the, when the unrighteous are ruled, they make it easy. What happens when you relax that? These, 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 these spiritual enemies go to work. It's relaxed on them. It's easy for them to steal, kill, and destroy. It's easy for the weather to go wild. It's easy for governments just to go nuts mm -hmm. when the people of God don't do their job. That's right. Join me in welcoming David Barton to this broadcast. David. Hey, Ken. Uh, let's go back over there at 2 Chronicles 7, where we were yesterday. David mentioned this to me. Uh, but, but just before we came on the air, the choice is ours. Two things that have that always been big with God. He's already made his choice. Mm -hmm. And he, his choice is whosoever. Now, uh, Keith Moore was... The, talking to me about this, and I heard him, uh, I heard him uh, preach on it also. But we had considerable discussion about it, and he went to God and he said, "I've heard people say this, and I'm I'm asking you about it." And I, he said, I, "I've I've had people uh, bring it up to me more than once. How can a loving God send somebody to hell?" And he said, man, the Lord spoke to him and answered him about that immediately. He said, Keith, it was not my choice. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you mean by that? Let's, well, in fact, mm -hmm. hold your place there in 2 Chronicles. Let's go to the book of Deuteronomy. And let's look at Deuteronomy 30, mm -hmm. 19. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing yeah. and cursing. Therefore, you choose life that both you and your seed may live, that you may love the Lord God and that you may obey his voice and that you may cleave unto him for he is your life and the length of your days that you may dwell in the land which the, Lord your, uh, which the Lord swore unto your fathers to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give them. Now, he, he said, look, I've, I've, I've made my choice. I have chosen you, but I have placed before you life and death. Now, it's up to you. You choose. Mm -hmm. Now, here we are in 2 Chronicles. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray. Seek my face. Now, what does he mean, seek my face? Find out what I have said about it. Find out what my word says. You remember what Jesus said, seek and you will mm -hmm. find. Knock and it will, will be, opened. be opened unto you. Ask and you shall receive, but you're going to do it his way. 
He that hath my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me. I will love him, my Father will love him, and I will manifest mm -hmm. myself to him. So Jesus is ready. God is ready. Now, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. I will heal their land. Now, we, we looked at this yesterday also in, uh, in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they'll be as wool. Oh, thank God. Yeah, if you're willing and yeah. obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Yeah. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured with a sword for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So here it again, is, it wasn't his choice, was That's it? That's right. He put the choice out there. And you know, the amazing part of it is uh, he wasn't the one doing the devouring. He's the one doing the protecting. That's right. That's right. You know, back with that, that one you just read in Deuteronomy 30, that whole book of Deuteronomy is an interesting book because it is the people who didn't die in the curse. Because when they came out of Egypt and God had them and said, now we're going to the promised land, and they said, oh, but there's giants. We hate fighting. We love the peace of the wilderness. And he said, okay, I've had it with you guys. Only the 20-year-olds and the others are going to make it. Everybody else dies in the wilderness. You love the wilderness, you can die there. And so that was their choice because he had them at the promised land. Yeah. They were ready to go in. They didn't want to. So he said, you guys die. So now you got the old man Moses who was part of that crowd who's now got all these 20-year-olds that have grown up. And he, he puts them all, and he, God's already told him, you're not going to the promised land. So Moses is standing there and he says, okay, I've got this whole generation of folks that need to know how we got here and what came before. And so the entire book of Deuteronomy is a long sermon that, that Moses gave the people, all these ones about to enter. The young guys, it's now their time to enter in. And he says, guys, we've been here before. We were here 40 years ago. Let me tell you what happened. And, and he takes them through the whole history of what God did to get them there. And, and that's a good reason to have history. History helps you prepare for the future. So he's got them there. And it's hard for us to imagine reading it, but if you can see it, he has got the whole group of Israel right there, and he's got two mountains behind him. Mm -hmm. And yeah. this is the mountain of blessing. This yeah. is the mountain of cursing. Over here, bad stuff. Over here, good stuff. Now, you guys cast your vote. And that's literally what they had to do. They had to cast a vote on whether they wanted to go to the blessing or cursing because the choice is theirs. God wants them on the blessing. If you want to choose the cursing, you can cast your vote and do that. But it was that thing, uh, and, and as you, you talked, even that, that scripture where he's manifest himself, we're told in Romans 8 that the creation is waiting for us to manifest ourselves. We need to cast a vote on this thing and get on with it because the whole world, creation, is waiting for us to do something with this. I mean, they're waiting for us to manifest ourselves in the same way He manifests Himself to us. He made a decision. We get the benefits of that. We make decision. Creation gets the benefits of that. But it comes back to our decision. And, and this is where, if we take it now in a voting season, let's take it back to an election, because he, he was telling them, cast a vote. You, you want to vote for the curses? You want to vote for the blessing? Whatever you cast your vote for, you're going to be part of. You'll be part of that system. And, and so with us in a voting perspective, you come back to Proverbs 29.2, and Proverbs 29.2 says, When the righteous rule, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, the people groan. Now, at that point, saying when the righteous rule, the people rejoice, the wicked rule, the people groan, it does not take a hearing aid to hear all the groaning going on across the land oh, today. Oh, yeah. The groaning People everywhere. Hurting, Dave. People and, and if the Word of God is true, which it is, why so much groaning? Because the wicked rule. Now, the significance of that in this country, I mean, this is not like other countries in the world. We're, we're not in China. We're not in North Korea. We're not in Cuba. We're not in, in so many of the uh, Middle Eastern countries. We get to choose whether the righteous or the wicked rule here. It is totally our choice. So if the groaning is going on here, it's because we've inflicted that on ourselves. We've cast a vote for the amount of cursing rather than the amount of blessing. We could have had the righteous rule, but we wanted the wicked rule. We chose policies. And so we're standing there between those two mountains, and we had a vote. And if we decided not to vote, you go with the cursing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's that simple because you didn't cast your vote for, for, for the win. Now, having said that, this is where, to me, where we are in America right now totally comes back to God really wants with all his heart to bless us. He's just waiting on us to do something. And if I, if I can kind of put it this way, 
been doing some research on current statistics. I'm going to take this sheet right here. That represents every adult in the United States that is 18 and older, and that means they can vote. By the Constitution, if you're 18 and older, you can vote. Now, what we have in America is only 67% of this group is even registered to vote. So what we'll do, we're going to take off one-third of this and say, all right, here's the people in America who can vote. When it comes to an election like we have this year, only 40% of that group votes. Now, let's play, let's play a presidential year because we have higher numbers in the presidential year. In a presidential year since 1980, of the registered voters, only 50% of them even vote. So that means half of the registered voters. So now we're going to cut this in half. And this is the amount of Americans that vote in a presidential election. So we, we started with this piece here, and this is the amount that votes in a presidential election. Now, it only takes... It only takes a majority to win. So all you need is half of this group here. So the President of the United States is picked by one out of six Americans. That's the size of the body that chooses the President of the United States. Five out of six Americans did not cast a vote for the President or did not cast a vote at all. How easy is it to turn the direction of the, of the nation? Now, we have by polling 78% of Americans say, I'm Christian. Well, I don't know where they are or not. They say they are. They at least wear the label. But I know that more than 16% is Christian. More than 16% mm -hmm. is strong yeah. Bible believing. And it's only one, you end up with only 16% of the nation choosing the president of the United States. So that's an easy thing to do. All we got to do is decide we want the nation to be blessed. We're going to cast our vote in a direction that will bless the nation. Now, when you come to an election like what we have now where we're choosing U.S. senators, and we're choosing congressmen and governors, you're back to the same thing where you have only, you have a third that doesn't vote. So we got the two-thirds that vote. But in these elections, less than half of this group votes. We're down to about 30, 38, 39 percent. And so out of that, it only takes a majority to win. So now we're back to here. And what that means is when we choose senators and governors, it's even smaller. It's only one out of eight Americans that choose governors and senators and, and congressmen means seven out of eight Americans did not choose the people who are ruling right now in, in Washington. Seven out of eight did not choose those people. How easy is that to fix? It's real easy if we decide that we want to cast a vote for blessing and not cursing. And, and that comes back to us. I mean, there, I mean, we say, God, heal our land. He says, well, if you guys will do something, I can do that. You know, I've already got it in motion to do. I'm just waiting on you to do something. It's, this is really easy. Now, let me take it a step further. In San Antonio, the civil leaders in San Antonio passed what's called a non-discrimination ordinance. And this is not new. Now, sir, just, just tell us who the, what a, the civil leaders are. In, who are they? In, in, a, in a city council area in San Antonio, you have a, Bayhar County, which is the county. But in the city itself, which is smaller than the county, mm -hmm. you have the mayor and the city council. Okay. And that's mayor like and your president that's and that's, that's your congress. Yeah. So mayor and city yeah. council. So non-discrimination ordinance has been sweeping the, the country in large cities and small cities for the last two or three years. And San Antonio is doing it as well. And so when San Antonio passed, there's a Christian who did something nobody else wanted to do. He went to city council meetings. No Christian loves to spend their time at city council meetings. Oh, who cares what size the manhole covers are? Who cares what size the sidewalks are? Who, who cares what they do? Like, I, I, I've got spiritual stuff to do. He sat in the city council meetings and he heard them when they passed this non-discrimination ordinance. And he brought it to the attention of other Christians and they said, oh no, they wouldn't do that. Well, as it turns out, they did. What they did was they say, if you believe that homosexuality is wrong and if you believe that traditional marriage should be between a man and a woman, as the Bible says, and if you're in office in San Antonio, you'll be dismissed from office. So if you hold a position that the Bible is right and that homosexuality is wrong and marriage is a man and a woman, you'll be just, and you say, wait a minute, you can't dismiss me from office. I was elected by the voters. No, but now by city law, it is called malfeasance in office. So if you hold those positions, you're kicked out of office. The next thing they said was, and by the way, this is a crime. So it is now a class C misdemeanor in San Antonio if you believe that homosexuality is wrong or if you believe marriage between a man and a woman. So it's a crime to believe, it's, it's, a, it's on the books now, it's a, it's a law, it's a crime to believe that. Furthermore, 
if you believe that and say that, it's $500 a day fine. You can't do this. I'm in America. I got a right of free speech. I got my right to my religious views. Yeah, not in San Antonio. And then on top of that, if I ever want to run for office and they can find me anywhere that I've ever said marriage is between a man and a woman, I am disqualified from running an office in San Antonio. That means no Bible-believing Christian who's ever expressed a view can run for office in San Antonio. And then on top of that, if I own a company, I'm not even allowed to do business with the city of San Antonio. If I build bridges or build highways or if I do landscape work and I believe that marriage is between a man and a woman, I can't <coughs> even do business. Now, here, here's where it gets interesting. That is, that is a local election. That is the, the city of San Antonio. The, the people in the city choose their mayor and they choose their city council. When it comes to voting across the board, city council election in San Antonio had 6% voter turnout. So now, if you take, let's just take 6% of, of the entire population, 100% of voters, 6%, 1 16th, we're talking, we're talking that group right now. The problem is, you have a third that's not registered, so we've got to tear it down to that. And then, of that, it only takes a majority to do it. So what we've got is, this is the size of the block that voted in the leaders of San Antonio. And they passed this wicked law and everybody in San Antonio now lives under it. You, look how many people didn't agree with the law, but they all live under the law now. Now, can God bless San Antonio with that kind of a law? I don't think so. No, they, they, they relaxed the, the whole spiritual power of, around that city, yeah. and it just loosed demons and devils. And they refused to, to stand up, and they're, they're supposed to be the preservative. The Christians are supposed to be the salt and the light. And you, you don't stay salt and light when you're inside the shaker or inside the cupboard. You got to get out where the stuff is, otherwise you can't preserve it. Yeah. And they refused to get involved, had it not been for that one guy who went to city council meeting. So you and I both know that San Antonio has got a lot more than 2% of Bible-believing Christians. Oh, in. man. And, and so how easy is it to turn that city around? God's waiting on the sons of God to manifest themselves, Romans 8, 19. If the sons of God will manifest themselves, creation will cheer over it. And that's what we have not been doing for a number of years. We who are the children of God have not been showing up to manifest. And this is the civil arena. It's the same in education arena. It's, a, it's the same in entertainment arena. It's the same in all these others. We don't like the stuff we see on TV, so rather than getting in there and fixing it and changing it, we just turn it off. Oh, why not go to Hollywood and take over Hollywood and get back to Cecil B. DeMille kind of, of films that we can have where the, you can go and take your family and you get edified by going to, to movies. And it's, it's not that way because rather than being salt and light and manifesting ourselves in creation, we're sitting back here and we just can't do that. And, and so, you know, I, I mean, San Antonio, you, you can't do that. And, you know, President of the United States, you, that's that little one. And, and congressmen and senators, that, this is, this is what we're talking about running the nation right now, that those little groups right there out of that large piece of paper, and it is so easy you for know us what to make I'm, a difference. You know what I'm seeing, David? We, when I say we, I'm talking about the body of Christ. I'm, talking, not, I'm not talking about the whole body of Christ. I'm talking about the, the people like us that live by faith yep. in the Word yep. of God. Yep. We have allowed the devil to run our country. Yep. Now, don't misunderstand me when I'm, when I'm saying this. I'm not talking about a, a bunch of bad people in, in office. You don't have to be a bad person yep to be deceived and not have any idea what the Bible yep. says about something. Yep. And then j there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end there of the, is, are the ways of death. And people that have no concept That's right. of, of how this thing's supposed to work make bad choices. It doesn't have to be malicious on their part. No, it no, can no. be uninformed. It can be innocently no. good, but it's just not doing it the right way. Now. I can pray for that person. Mm -hmm. God influenced their thinking. But when I'm in a state of disobedience to God, right. I shouldn't have elected him in the first That's right. place. That's right. And to have him in office and say, well, I'm going to pray for him. Yeah, you pray for him. 
but get them out of office and pray for them at home and where they don't well, have Well, and the an thing of it is, my, even if, even if I, if I voted and I believed I voted the way God told me to vote, my heart's honest before God. Now, I'm functioning in the kingdom of God and I'm separated from that Babylonian yeah. system here. And, and, and things are well in my household because of it. Mm -hmm. But if I didn't, then as I pray because of the mess that I'm in, my heart condemns me yeah. because I didn't do what God, yeah. uh, what God's Word teaches. I didn't do what I should have done. I didn't take care of moral responsibility mm -hmm. and pray over this thing and vote the way I should have prayed and got up off of my lazy backside and, and went down there and voted the way I knew I should That's have right. voted to start with. That's right. And it goes back before the election itself. It goes back to the candidates. Who are you picking as a candidate? And that's back to the primaries. And, and we get Christians saying, oh, I don't want to be seen part of either party, so I'm, I'm neutral in the primaries. Well, Bubba, if you're not getting involved in primaries, then all you're going to have in November is a choice between the bad and the worst. Because yeah. nearly always you got good guys down here, but if you refuse to advance them to the general election, if you refuse to get involved in the primaries and make sure the good guys are there, you're always going to get the choice between the bad and the worst. And that's a self-inflicted wound because we say, oh, I don't want to appear to be partisan. Don't be partisan. Take your principles, go into both parties, take over both parties, take over all 17 parties. We actually have 17 different parties in the United States. Take them all over. And, and then make sure good candidates get through to November yeah, and then you amen. get a good choice. Brother David, welcome again hey, today, Ken. brother. I, uh, <clears throat> this thing, have faith in God. Jesus said, he just made that bold statement to them, 11th chapter of Mark. They said, look at the fig tree that dried up. He said, have faith in God. That struck me one day. Well, what about the government? Have faith in God. Mm -hmm. Well, what about my health? Have faith in God. What about who pays the bills? Have faith in God. I mean, that's, that is the answer and the key. Have faith in God. Yeah. Well, then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. So let's, and faith works by love. So now we haven't been here five minutes and we've already found out some very important things. Let's go over to the book of James and let's look here in the, uh, oh, there's two or three places here that, that uh, I want to uh, look. Well, let's start in the second chapter of James. In verse 14, what does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith mm -hmm. and has not works? Can faith or faith alone save him? Um, if a brother or sister be naked, destitute of daily food, and one say, just uh, depart in peace, or, or be warmed and be filled, <laughs> notwithstanding you help him, you need to give him something to eat and something to wear. Mm -hmm. So there's a corresponding action yeah, to that's faith. Right. That's right. I can say I have faith in God, but then I have to put that faith into operation. I have to put it into action. And it works by love. Yeah. So there's, there's a concept here that the Lord dropped in my spirit about how does this affect what we do as a people, as Christian people. The just shall live by faith, Now, how does that af if affect what I do as a citizen in the nation in which I live? Mm -hmm. It's got to create some responsibilities here because the scripture says I'm supposed to be praying for all men, for kings, and for all mm -hmm. that are in authority that the church live a quiet and peaceable life. Well, now, David, in the United States, we, and we're not the only nation, but 
we're, uh, we're bumping right up next to election times here in just a few days here, mm -hmm. here, here in the United States. And um, how does that affect me? How do those commands mm -hmm. from Jesus, how do the commands of the Word affect that? Where voting or not voting, or for whom do I vote? Where do I make my stand? Mm -hmm. And it's very, very significant in, in me. It, it, it's turned into a it's turned into an issue of honor yeah. with me yeah. over a period of years. I've been living and walking by faith specifically on purpose for 47 plus years. Mm -hmm. And right away, this began to be a thing of honor between God and me. Mm -hmm. The way I vote doesn't just affect me. Yeah, that's right. And if I'm going to pray and ask God um, to help me in this nation, um, is it just so that I can go to church it, uh, um, with, without harassment? It's far yeah. more important yeah, than that. Bet. And that's, you know, just going to church without harassment, if I can say so, is purely selfish anyway. That's so that I can live in peace. What about everybody else? That's yeah, and Christian brethren, and and that's right. hey, and the gospel that's been coming out of this nation for oh well over a hundred years. You know, regardless of whether people like America or not, it doesn't change the fact that eighty-five percent of all the resources to preach the gospel across the world come out of America. Yes. If America yes. gets shut down. Church yes. of God is going to go on, but it's going to have a tough time for a while. It'll be rough to It'll get it It'll be rough done. for a while. And, and, you know, you were talking about, all right, faith, but there's works, but love makes it operate. Now, I was reminded of something that, that fits right in with that, and it goes back to even what you're saying about this, this thing of, of honor. Um, Dr. Benjamin Rush was one of our founding fathers. He's a signer of the Declaration. John Adams, who's one of our chief founding fathers, he said, Benjamin Rush is one of the three most notable. According to John Adams, you had George Washington, Ben Franklin, and Benjamin Rush. Now, we'll never study Benjamin Rush's school today for a lot of reasons. One is the Founding Fathers are supposed to be a bunch of racists. Well, Benjamin Rush started the first abolition society in America. He headed the National Abolition Movement, huge civil rights guy, helped found the first black denomination in America, trained the first black physicians in America, so he does all the civil rights stuff. On top of that, Founding Fathers are supposed to be atheists and agnostics and deists, and he's the guy who started the Sunday School Movement in America. He started the first Bible Society in America. Uh, in that Bible, I've got his original constitution. He said, if we can get Americans to read the Bible, he said, two things will happen. One, they'll find Jesus. They'll, they'll come to know Jesus. He said, but two, if they'll live by what's in here, he said, we'll solve all of our social problems. He said, we won't have crime. We won't have slavery. He went through all the stuff. So he came up with the first way to mass, first, first mass produce Bible in America. And that's what we could buy cheap and give to our friends to get them in God's Word. And, and so he, he's the guy, so we don't talk about him because he's, he's that way. He's also a huge political leader. And as a political leader, he signed the Declaration, ratified the Constitution, served in three different presiden presidential administrations, and was the director of the U.S. Mint. On top of that, he did the first faith-based prison reform in America, re reformed the prison system to get it back to restitution and, and victims, and restoring victims, not restoring the government, restoring victims. And so he's big on that. And then on top of that, he's the greatest physician in American history. To this day, he's still called the father of American medicine. 3,000 kids got their medical diplomas with his signature on it. And on top of that, He's called the father of public schools under the Constitution. He started five universities. Three of them still go today. He's the first professor of chemistry ever in the United States. Did the first psychiatry textbook. Did all this stuff. And, and I have so many of his original writings. And, and in one of those writings, here he is. He's a, just a strong, devout evangelical Christian, very much involved in all this stuff. And he pointed out a couple things that, that just strike me with what you're saying. One is he said, the, the love of your country or patriotism is as much of a social duty as is justice. So if a Christian is for justice, he should also be for patriotism because as he points out, by 
Patriotism, you want what's best for your country. By wanting what's best for your country, you're wanting what's best for your neighbors. And you're helping your, if you get involved with your country and seek what's best for your country, you're blessing your neighbors because then they can live in peace, then they can have no crime, then they can all the, yeah, yeah. and the only way you can bless your neighbors through that kind of public policy is if you get involved, say, I love my country so much, I have to make sure it has good policies. I love my country so much, I've got to make sure it has righteous leaders so that God can bless the nation, which means every person in the nation. If I love my neighbors as myself, I've got to get involved for their behalf. They may want, not want to be involved in government, but I've got to be because that's how I can bless them. Mm -hmm. And so every voter saw that perspective. And it is significant that if you go back to that founding period, um, Daniel Webster, who grew up in that founding era, listening to George Washington, whatever, he became one of the, the most significant guys in Congress, considered the greatest order in the history of the Senate. When he was running for office, we were so convinced that we had a duty to put the best people in office and that we had a duty to vote every election, a duty to vote, not a right to vote, a duty to vote. Duty to vote, yeah. That Absolutely. in his election for Congress, there were a total of 5,000 people that were adults in his district. 5,000 adults cast 5,000 votes. And as it turns out, he got 4,990 of them. So I guess just the guy and his family voted for the other one. But, you know, <laughs> but every, every, everybody voted. And, and that was the mentality. I've got to serve my neighbors. I've got to do what's best for them, bring best policy. And, and so that aspect of Benjamin Rush really strikes me with what you're saying. That it was a matter of honor and that, you know, we, we've got to do this. The other thing that strikes me is when Benjamin Rush, in 1790, he did the piece that called him to be called, become the fa called the father of public schools under the Constitution. Because what happened in 17... 87, they write the Constitution. 1788, he, he's one of the ratifiers. 1789, we now have a federal government going. And in 1790, he wrote a piece called On the Mode of Education Proper in Our Republic. And the question was this, is we've been 13 nations. We've been 13 separate states, nations like Europe. Now that we're one nation, what are we going to have to teach in schools if we're going to stay one nation? And so as a leading educator, he went through and laid out what public schools had to do. Now, grab this. He said, the, the number, if we're, going to stay, if we're going to stay a strong nation, the number one purpose of public education is to teach students to love and serve God. He said the number two purpose of public education is to teach students to love and serve their country. And the number three purpose of public education is to teach students to love and serve their family. Now, he said, God, country, family. Every Christian I've talked to in my lifetime has said, God, family, country. Mm -hmm. But he said, God, now why would he say that? And he points out, he says, if you ever lose control of your country, they will become the great enemy to your family. You go, yeah, exactly. Look at all the stuff we're fighting now that's attacking our family, the moral stuff, the trash. It's stuff. happening right now, right in front of right us. Right in front of us. It, and it's because we lost our government. We've lost our policy. If we had gone God first, served government, then we would have better protection for our families from all the trash that's attacking them. He was exactly right. That's, and, and so you saying that just reminds me, man, that's exactly the thinking. And then, then the influence of the United States would have been a blessing to the world yeah. as it, as it yeah. once was. The kind of stuff we would be exporting is the Cecil B. DeMille movies rather than the kind of things we see. Now, I will say that this, this is one of the areas we talked yesterday about how that in Romans 8, 19 through 23, the whole creation is groaning for the sons of God to manifest themselves, mm -hmm. show up. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that in Hollywood now, there is a massive growing group of strong biblical people. There's probably a thousand that meet in a group there. They're, they're, they're rising through the ranks. They're not quite all the Hollywood producers and the big names, but they're replacing all these lower guys. And in last year in America, we had more pro-faith, pro-family box office movies than we've had in the past 10 years combined. And how'd that happen? Because we started putting people into the process. They're starting mm -hmm. to get back in. Yep. And soon we'll be exporting good things if we'll keep doing it. But we got to get people involved in education the same way, in medicine the same way. We got to get God's people involved in politics the same way. We got to get involved in business with the same Bible mentality. And then we become a blessing to everybody. And, and you're right, we've gotten away from that. And what we export now across the world is not good for 
most most folks. But we used to be able to export really good things out, and that can happen again if if we'll make the choice. David, I I, I want you to uh, comment on this too. We've been talking about God healing the land. Yeah. Um, it is never too late. No. I was d deeply impressed with this a few weeks ago that we are on the threshold right now of this nation being reborn and that we're in the same place right now that the, the framers of the Constitution and, and, and those that were involved in the American Revolution and so forth, they didn't know what this government was going to look like. Yeah. They didn't know what it was going to evolve into. They, they, they had very little concept of the finished product mm -hmm. because nobody had ever done it before. That's right. I believe God is ready if we'll believe yeah. Him for it and we as a people will stand with Him and believe God that the kingdom of God is about to produce something in the resurrection of this nation that's, that's beyond what at this point we're able yeah. to ask or think. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and one of the good things about knowing history and the Bible is you see how many times God brought a nation back from the brink of absolute destruction. And some of them after total destruction. Well, some of them after total yeah. you know, Israel came back after a period of how many oh, years? Oh, yeah. But it's interesting that if you look at the Wesley brothers, John and Charles, what they were facing in England before God used them to bring change to England, America's nowhere close to where England was. And, and, and God brought them back as a strong nation. Now, you know, they're sliding again now into secularism. But God brought them back for a century and a half as a powerful, godly nation. We have what happened in Scotland. We have what happened in, in Wales with the revivals there. That the, the, the country got so pagan, so corrupt, so debauched in so many ways. And the people said, it's gone, you know, and, and God brought them back. And, and so it's not, it's not Ichabod. The glory has not departed. God can, can bring this back. He's just waiting for us to show up. Yeah. He's, I, I've yeah. got a plan. I just need some tools. Give me some tools to work with, and I can say, and that's us. He, we just need to be the tools in his hands that he can use to bring this nation back. And we can't do that if we refuse to get involved. I mean, the problem we had the church, we were told to be fishers of men, and the church loves fish, but they want them all clean when they get there. I'm sorry, when you catch fish, they're not clean. You've got a lot of work <laughs> yeah, to do. You've got a lot of you know, work to do. And churches too often Amen. want the fish to be clean when they come in, and that's not going to be it. If you're not willing to get out there and, and get your hands dirty and get in the middle of the stuff, it's not going to be what it's supposed to be. And uh, there's no doubt in my mind, historically, biblically, American history, world history, you name it, nah, we're not anywhere close to no, too far gone. We're, we are at a place right now that uh, we're, we're in store for, for something that is just grand. Mm -hmm. You know, when uh, 1948, 49, and 50, right after World War II, mm -hmm. and the healing and miracle ministry just exploded in, yeah. in Oral Roberts' life. I mean, it just... Uh, it was something that, that he knew for a long time that something was happening. It was, uh, and, but all of a sudden there was an anointing there that hadn't been there the day before. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just uh, Brother Oral's ministry. There was, there were a number were. of men. Now, a few days ago, well, a few weeks ago now. Um, Brother T.L. Lowry, Dr. T.L. Lowry down in Cleveland, Tennessee, he had a 10,000 seat tent right in those same times, right in the same time that, that Oral and A.A. A. Allen and, mm -hmm. and Jack Coe and, and all these other tent preachers were out there. And that anointing was in 
all of these uh, tent congregations. It was just, yeah. I got in on the very last of Brother Robert's tent meetings. And David, I saw that anointing. Mm -hmm. And, and I, it sometimes, the only way I describe it was just, just the air was just electric. People just mm -hmm. couldn't keep from shouting. It just, and a, and a miracle would occur. And it just, your, your mind just, just had to just take leave of the situation because it just couldn't handle it. Yeah. And I tell you, I, I saw that in two different <laughs> and oh, whew, you want it back so bad? I mean, you want to, yeah. let's do this again, but you can't engineer it. Yeah. Yeah. That was in Brother T.L.'s tense as well. Well, they were celebrating T.L. Lowry's 70th ministry anniversary. Wow. Been in the ministry 70 years. Wow. And he was just, just barely past a teenager when he had that tent wow. in, the, in the early 50s. And oh, man, I'm telling you, he had, just like the rest of them only, T.L. had a really, really special anointing. Mm -hmm. Well, I walked in that gathering room uh, there at his, uh, his place in Cleveland, Tennessee, and I just walked flat into that anointing. Yeah. Rod Parsley, I opened it that evening. Rod finished it. He just came out of surgery, and they had cut his foot from one side to the other. When he walked on the platform, the healing of his foot, it just, it was just healed right there. Right there. I, here's what I heard the Lord say. It's back big time. Yeah. Yeah. We're there. Yeah. Now, what does that have to do with government? Everything. Everything. Because Everything. this thing this time is spilling over That's right. into government, spilling over into... Right. It, and it's important that we believe God and take care of business right. in the kingdom of God. Go pray and then go vote. Yeah. Heaven is a real place. People live, they have life there. I've got kin folks there. You've got kin folks there, David, I know. And a lot of you got, everybody's got some kin folks there, amen. And soon and very soon, all of this is going to change. I tell you, death is going to be swallowed up in life. Glory to God. But those of us that already know him, that life is residing inside yeah. of us right now. Praise God. These are precious, precious moments right here in, in just the last moments. <laughs> There's a, did, did you know all of the, and I'm talking about the Hebrew calendar now, that Hebrew calendar that 6,000 years have come and gone, and the 7,000th year, the millennial reign of Christ Jesus is just, just, just right here. I mean, we're just being pressed between those two. And this little sliver of time, this little moment of grace in which we are living and functioning right now. Glory to God. Everything God said must come to pass before this would happen is going to happen right here and right now, and we're in it. <laughs> Amen. We're there. Mm -hmm. Now, that's the reason why this God-founded nation of the United yeah. States is so important. It's not because of our military. It's yeah. not because of any of all that. It's because of the faith of God that's in this country and in its yeah. people. Hallelujah. That's right. And we not only need to pray for this nation, which we do. Mm -hmm. We not only need to pray for our leaders, which we do need to be doing that. And we're doing that. If you're going to live by faith, you don't have any choice. You need to be doing that. Yeah. But we also have certain ownership responsibilities. We own this country. Yeah. We, in Jesus, we own this planet, man. Yeah. He got it back. And right now, we have opportunity to hear from him, and we have an opportunity to make startling votes with a startling number of people and change this thing right. because we're in a time for the, for, the, for the sweeping of the most 
people into the kingdom of God in the history of this planet. Mm -hmm. And we're there. We are. We're right there. Outstanding things are happening. And we need to do what's necessary in our prayer time, in our witnessing time. We need to come alive as God's people, and we need to cover these poles up. They need to be saying, we ain't never seen so many Christians right. come out and vote That's in all right. of our life. We didn't know they could do it. That's right. That's right. And swing this thing towards the preaching of the gospel yep. and the love of God and the love for people. Yep. And Father, we thank you today for this. We give you praise and honor, sir. We open our hearts. We have ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. David, I'm excited. Praise God. Yep. Amen. Let's, let's look at something here. I, when, I, when this came up in my spirit, uh, I said, Lord, what, how, how do, how, how, what are you saying here out of 1 John 5, verse 1? Because that's the scripture I've kept here and come up. Whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ yeah. is born of God. And everyone that loves him that gave birth also loves him that was born of him. And by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Now that's not talking about just, just talking about the Ten Commandments. That's talking about everything that God tells you to do. Jesus said, he that has my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loves me. And I, and I will love him, my Father will love him, and I will manifest myself to him. So this is, this is way of life here. Mm -hmm. Now, for this is loving God that we keep His commandments. His commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world. This is the victory that overcomes the, this, this kingdom of darkness called the world, this Babylonian system trying to meet its own needs without God, don't want God, don't want to hear anything of God. Yeah, but then there's a lot of people in there that need to hear from God. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Yeah. And faith is the victory that overcomes that system. Yeah. So it's time to have faith in God here, yeah. David. Yeah, it is. It's time to believe God. Mm -hmm. Well, we're, oh, but think about this huge problem we got. No, 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 don't think about that. Think about this huge God that we yeah, have. That's right. That's Amen. Right. Makes that little, I mean, yeah. with God's plan and God's wisdom, faith overcome anything. It will. And he needs people in there who can touch him and get that faith yes, he does. and apply the solutions. Yes, he does. You're not going to get that faith solution through unbelievers who hate God and hate what he stands for. David, think about this now for a moment. You and I have accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And Jesus said, by doing that, we are born from on high. We are born again. Now, this, this inner man is a new creature in Christ Jesus. Now, I can't go ask somebody that doesn't know God Mm -hmm. not connected to him, mm -hmm. but is connected to darkness, I can't go ask him who I am. That's right. He don't know. That's right. <laughs> There's no way. I have to go to God for that. That's right. Now, I can't ask him what I should do over here in business because he don't know. That's right. And he, he may be trying to help me and still give me all the wrong mm -hmm. Information. I can't ask that person to have authority and govern the education of my children mm -hmm. because he doesn't know who they are either. That's right. That's right. I was in a uh, situation where I had preached for hours and hours and hours for days and days, and my, my voice just, it, it, it just seemed like it just evaporated right mm -hmm. in the middle of a service. 
and we had a, a break between one service and the next service broke for lunch. And I'm back there praying. I couldn't talk, man, out of my voice. That's about as loud as I could get right there. And I'm like, Lord, what, what am I going to do here? <laughs> and this came out. Lord, if I were to ask my voice if it's healed, it would say no. Mm -hmm. If I were to ask my body if it was healed, it would say no. Mm -hmm. But I didn't ask my body, and I didn't ask my voice. Yeah. I asked you a word, and every time I went to it, it said, by my stripes you, you were healed. healed. So I didn't ask my voice. If I had it, it'd say no. I didn't ask my body. If I had it, it'd say no. I went to your word. Well, so I did that, and I walked out there on the platform, and they could, still couldn't hear me by the first row. So I took the microphone, and I held it up in my mouth just as close as I could get it. I went through that whole thing. I said, if I were to ask you if I was healed, you'd say, no. If I asked my voice, it'd say no. If I asked my body, it'd say no. But I didn't ask you. I didn't ask my voice. I didn't ask my body. I went to the Word of God, and it said I'm here. And I mean, it just came back in a roar. Yeah. Yeah. Now, there's a point there to be made for having faith in God, overcoming this world. Yeah. That in that moment, it overcame that situation in my voice. Mm -hmm. It'll do the same thing where this nation is concerned. Yeah, that's right. I'm not asking the government. I'm not asking that. I'm not asking people that don't know God. I've gone to God, yeah. and He said we can have our nation stronger than ever. Yep. Yep. One of the things that has stood out to me, in, and I think people are starting to grasp this, is there are two different views. There, there's a view of darkness and a view of light. I mean, God's view and there's the other view. And if you want to have God's things, you've got to have God's view on things. You cannot have darkness and get God's results. I mean, it's just not going to work. And we know that in spiritual stuff. We know that in our personal life. And somehow we don't apply that to our political life. And it has to be applied. You cannot apply principles of darkness and get results of light. No, you can't do it, it that. Just, it cannot that be done. That is not going to happen. It cannot be done. Well, let me, there's, there's something that I've really gotten onto recently. I, I made a few slides. Let me just throw something out. This is something we started earlier in the week. I want to take you through San Antonio because we talked about San Antonio and how that the leaders in San Antonio have come out with this thing that says, well, if you say anything about homosexuality, if you say anything about homosexual marriage, you're dismissed from office. They call it malfeasance in office. Number two, they said it's a Class C misdemeanor, so we'll make it a crime if you say these certain things. Number three, uh, we're going to give you a $500-a-day fine. So if my business doesn't want to participate actively in a homosexual wedding by supplying flowers or cake or photography or something, I don't, you're still going to be fined. Every, every day you say, no, I can't be part of that. And you're prohibited from running for office in the future if you say anything. And on top of that, you can't do any business with the city. So if I've got a business, I'm not allowed to engage in business with the city if I believe that marriage is between a man and a woman or I think homosexuality is wrong. Now, it's, it's interesting because what happened, a lot of Christians, I've been down in San Antonio doing a lot down there with these guys and other places across the country, and Christians say, they can't do that. The Constitution gives us a right of free speech. Under our Constitution, we've got the right to say what we think. We also have a constitutional right for a guarantee of free exercise of religion. I can express my faith by saying what I will and won't be part of. And on top of that, I've got a constitutional guarantee for the right of association. I don't have to associate with everybody the government tells me. I can choose who I associate with. I, I've got all They can't do that. And, and what folks have failed to understand that the Bible teaches so well is that while our rights are constitutionally given, they are politically protected. And if you put people in office who hate God and hate what he stands for, you will not get the results that we were designed to get. And what really drove this home to me was when you go back to the 55 guys who wrote our Constitution, and these guys use so many biblical principles. And do I mean, quite frankly, if you know the Bible and read the Bible and read the Constitution, you see Bible verses all over it. I mean, I didn't even know what the Bill of Attainder was, but I found out it came out of Ezekiel 18:20, and that's one of our clauses in the Constitution. John Adams has three letters saying, well, separation of powers in the Constitution was based on Jeremiah 17:9." And so these guys went through and showed all these Bible verses. But 
as they were writing the Constitution, one of the guys at the convention was a guy named John Francis Mercer. And John Francis Mercer was talking, uh, and he, he told the other delegates something that I think is really good. And, and here they are writing this document in which we now govern ourselves, and this is what he told them. He said, it's a great mistake to suppose that the paper were to propose to govern the United States. Now, that's a heretical thing to say with all these guys writing the Constitution. He says, time out, guys. Does anybody really think the Constitution is going to govern America? He's, he says, you're crazy if you think that. He continued, he said, it's the men that the Constitution will bring into the government, the interests they have in maintaining that will govern them. He said, the paper will only mark out the mode and the form, men of the substance, and members do the business. He said, what we've done is we've given you a piece of paper that shows you how to get people in office. But if you don't put people in office who like this paper and who will follow this paper, then this paper is absolutely worthless in the hands of people. And, I mean, that's exactly where we are. We keep putting people in office thinking, well, we have laws. They'll follow the laws. We put people in office thinking, they can't do that. That's not the value system of America. We keep putting people in office thinking they're going to follow the, the book, and that's not the case. And, and that's why when you go back to what the Constitution says, yeah, we've got these rights, but they're also, they're also politically protected. And I think this is where Christians are starting to get today in America, is that we understand that we've got a certain... Real easy. I can go to Matthew 28. Jesus commands me to go preach the gospel to every creature. So mm -hmm. I think I'll obey, obey Jesus. I'm going to run over to Saudi Arabia, step on a street corner. I'm going to do exactly what he told me to do. And as soon as I do, I'm going to get arrested, as the pastor over there just did for preaching the gospel. Mm -hmm. They threw him in jail. They called it blasphemy. He's waiting to be beheaded. They can't do that, Jesus. Yeah, our rights are biblically given, but they are politically protected. We have a pastor in Phoenix, Arizona, who spent 90 days in jail in America, in Phoenix, because he had a Bible study at his house. And it turns out Phoenix City Council has an ordinance that says you can't have a Bible study in your house. So he got 90 days in jail. And they didn't just come knock on his door and say, Pastor, you can't do that. They came in with a SWAT team, AR-15s, all going in. What did he do? He had a Bible study in America. We, we now have a, a website called religioushostility.org that has 1,200 incidences like that listed of people are finding out, you know, I thought I had all these constitutional, I live in America, they can't do that. No, it's not the documents that give you that. It's the right people in office, which is where we get back to the Bible, Proverbs 29. When the righteous rule, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, the people in Hawaii. Because when the righteous rule, they'll use this when they get there. And they're going to get the results. They'll get the economic results that God promises. They'll get the peace results in the nation God promises. They'll get the strong families God promises. But if you put the wicked in office, they're not going to use anything out of this. And I don't care how good the book is, they'll leave it laying on the table. And this does nothing when it's laying on the table. If it's not applied, and it can't be applied unless people who believe this get in there, which is why we, I mean, we're at election time in America. If we don't start standing up and saying, I'm going to find people who believe this, and I'm going to put them in office, and if I can't find them, I'll run myself. I'm, I'm going to get somebody in office that understands these prints. That's the only way the Constitution works. And, some, and somebody needs to be bringing these atrocities to... to to, uh, to our awareness. To, to awareness, yeah. See, and they're not anybody going to do that until somebody, some, some believer speaks up because they're the only ones going to say that. That's it. right. The, the media refuses to cover this. Why? Because they think it's great. They think Christians ought to be in those places. They don't, this is not news to them. Now, we would cover it because it's news to us. That's where your worldview comes in. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a biblically minded person is going to point out when violations of those principles occur. An anti-biblical person is going to love it when violations of those principles occur because they hate this thing. And so we will never get this on the news as long as we refuse to get involved in the media. Oh, kids, you're going to college, don't get involved in the media. That's secular stuff. Well, as long as you're going to have that attitude, it'll stay secular stuff. Mm -hmm. If you're not willing to go in there and be salt and light and be strong enough in your faith to go in there and say, you know what, I'm going to become America's favorite newscaster at night and I'm going to have a different worldview. If you don't go into that attitude, it'll never change. And that's why we can sit back and pray all we want. And all the prayers we pray are good prayers, but God needs hands out there. And we're the hands and we're the feet and we're, the, I mean, He's not going to just reach down and slap somebody in the face and say, oh, you're thinking wrong. He, he can. I mean, he did that with Darius and he did that with Cyrus and some others. He did it with Nebuchadnezzar for sure. Had him grazing grass for seven years on his hands and knees and he got a new mind out of it. But generally, God's waiting for us to do something. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what we have got to get. And, and we have got to, I mean, exactly the stuff you were talking about. He is really big and he can do really big things. He just needs us to go out there and... and, and be the opportunity for him to show himself big. I mean, and 
And so I, I, I've just, I'm watching this happen in America now that we're starting to realize some basic principles. But they go back to Proverbs 29 too. You don't get the right people in office. It doesn't matter how good your documents are. You get, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, you get uh, Manasseh as your king. It doesn't matter that he's got the word of God and the temple and he's in God's land. Manasseh is your king as a wicked king and you're going to have a lot of trouble. You're going to hurt. You, you're going to hurt because of it. Unless you walk by faith. Yeah. Yep. And you're, you're living, seeking first the kingdom of God. Yep. And everything that that Everything entails, that means, that's right. Which definitely includes our whole political and It absolutely does. Because it has such an influence on absolutely everything does. that happens. If you're trying to live your life over here in this Babylonian system yeah. and you're hung into that and you're, and well, you know, I don't want to speak up too much. I might lose my job. You're going to lose your job. You're going to lose your job. And well, you know, I don't, again, I just don't want to stir the pot. Hey, you're the meat in the pot. Yeah, that's right. I, you know, one of the things that has stood out to me is particularly as we're looking at voting in a week, the overwhelming cause for people voting in America today is economics. The, their job, the economy, uh, what's happening with, with money. And Jesus had this conversation with the disciples in Matthew 6, and they said, Jesus, where are we going to get our next meal? Uh, what about our clothing? What about our food? He said, come on, guys. Look at the sparrows. Look at the lilies. They get clothed. They get fed. They don't worry about where it comes from. He said, if you will seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all this other stuff will get added to you. And what happens is when we seek economics or prosperity or something else and not righteousness, you'll lose the righteousness and the prosperity. Yeah. If you seek yeah. the righteousness, yeah. you'll get the righteousness and the prosperity. But it starts first. He said, if you'll seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, then all this other stuff will get added to you. The, your food and your clothing, your lodging, your transportation. But if you seek that first, you'll lose that and you'll lose the righteousness. And that's where we are in the nation. We've got to say, you know what? I'm, I'm voting, but I'm not voting on the basis of economy or job or anything else. I'm voting on the basis of biblical righteousness. What is right and what is, what right. is wrong. And God will then prosper off of that. But he's, he, he, it starts and if, with the righteousness. And if my voting that way and my standing up that way gets me laid off, well, so be it, because I'm standing on the, I'll never miss a deal, That's right. I'll never miss a meal, I'll never miss a lick in this thing, because the kingdom takes care of me, not That's right. the company. The lilies of the field are always clothed, the sparrows have always got something to eat, and it comes from their creator. It Amen. comes from God. I was, <laughs> I was walking down the street, in uh, Steamboat Springs, Colorado, one of my favorite places on earth. And I had a number of, of uh, our friends with us and, and different couples, and we were walking along at one of my favorite stores. In fact, I bought this shirt in that store. FM Light. FM yeah, Light, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And and yeah. and here was this here was this the whole store window was filled with with the the great posters about the 4th of July and about the nation. And I'm standing there looking at these. Gloria said, I'm telling you, wonder where they got that. That's the most outstanding looking pictures I've ever seen of this. And, um, and uh, one of the other guys said, we got to find out where this came from. So I walked back. I know the guy that owns the store and I walked back there and I asked for him, I said, is, is he here? She said, no, he's not in. I said, well, maybe you can tell me. Where did you get those outstanding pictures in the, in the window in the front of the store? She said, well, it's actually a ministry from Texas called Wall Builders, and his name is David Barton. I thought, <laughs> yeah, are you kidding? <laughs> well, yeah, no wonder there was a great presentation. And it, it, it really it stirred up that city, David. I, and I, oh, good. it really, it blessed us. I, yeah, that's my friend. He did that. <laughs> yeah. But that's the fun part. When you get to go back and see history, it can become alive. Oh, it, yeah. I mean, we have so goofed it up in the United States today that it's boring, it's dull, nobody likes it. And that's because we don't do history the way God did history. I mean, in, in the Bible, if you want to learn about the Philistines, you study the life of Samuel. You study the life of Saul. You study the life of David. 
in American schools, you want to learn about the Philistines, we'll give you all the dates, all the times. There's nothing interesting about that. <laughs> no. God not knows at all. that we respond. You know, we respond to stories. Even Revelation 12, 11 says we overcome the enemy because of the blood of the Lamb and because we love not our lives to death, but also the word of our word testimony. Word of our testimony. When we share our story, and people get into yeah. stories. They, and I like, and what, it's just, I like what Mr. Huckabee said about, about the one of the. One of the major problems in our schools is the students are bored out exactly of their right. mind. Exactly right. Exactly right. They don't want to hear this stuff. You know, what we used to teach American history by saying, you want to learn about the American Revolution? Let's read a biography on George Washington. Let's read one on Wentworth Cheswell. Let's read one on Abigail Adams. Let's, let's read one on all these famous... We don't do that anymore. I mean, we don't even talk about those people anymore. So it's all a disconnected series of dates and, and places. And what does that help me today? Well, if I get into somebody's shoes, if I see their story, I go, oh, I, I know exactly how you feel. I, yeah, I've had that situation, and it becomes alive to you. But sure. the way we teach it today has no relevance to anything at all. I mean, it, it's like memorizing a maintenance book for a lawnmower. You know, <laughs> it, has, it, has no, it, it may be useful to somebody, but not for most of those sitting in classrooms. And that's the fun part about American history. It's got so much life in it, so much God in it, so much good stuff in it. And it's, it's a lot of fun. Get us in there, David. Let's you know, get in the Word. One, one of the things that, that we talked earlier in the week, Proverbs 29, 2, in the righteous rule, the people rejoice, and the wicked rule, the people groan. And one of the things that we observed was that there's a lot of groaning going on. So obviously a lot, of, a lot of wrong rulers. This is where knowing our history makes a lot of difference on how you get good rulers. And knowing the Bible makes a huge difference. And, and one of the things that's happened in the church today, I, I love Romans, and I love the book of Romans. Romans 12, King James says, Be not conformed to this world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Yeah. But I particularly love that verse in the Phillips translation. And what it says is, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold. And what's happened, in a lot of ways, the church in America, which is now surrounded with hostile people who hate the church, who hate Christians, who hate God, they're telling us what our role can be. And, and we're, they're, make, they're put, squeezing us into their mold. Putting and pressure. Pastors, you can't talk about Pastors, this is what churches do. Pastors, you can't say this out of the pulpit. Hey, Christians, you don't get involved. In and so what happens is all these people who are our enemies are telling us what we can and can't do. Now, whoa, 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 time out. Number one, I got the Bible to tell me what the church, the role of the church is. Number two, in America, I have a lot of history, 400 years of history. And number three, I've also got the Constitution. And a lot of what they're telling us that we can't do violates Bible and history and Constitution, but we are law-abiding citizens, and so we don't want to disobey the law. And so they tell us what the fiction of the law is, and it's not the law. So one of the things that's happened is one of the reasons we have had such groaning across the country. I don't care whether it's, it's local, county, state, or federal races. We've got so many leaders that are not the right kind. is because we've forgotten what it is that the church is supposed to do. So I want to go back to Judges 9 for a moment mm -hmm. and talk about an example there where the, the trees of the forest got together to, to choose their civil leader. I'm going to do it kind of illustrated. I'm going to do it with pictures. So here, here's the parable of the trees of the forest, Judges 9, 8 through 15. And scripture starts by saying, one day the trees went out to anoint a ruler for themselves. So they're getting a civil leader. And it says they went first of all to the fig tree and they, or to the olive tree and they said to the olive tree, come be our leader. But the olive tree answered and said, no, I'm not going to be your leader. It said, should I give up my oil by which both gods and men are honored to hold sway over the tree? So you got the olive tree, great tree, productive tree. And it says, no, I'm too busy being productive. Then it says they went next to the fig tree and they said to the fig tree, come be our leader. And the fig tree replied, no, I'm not going to be your leader. Should I give up my fruit so good and sweet to hold sway over the trees? It said, next they went to the vine, and they said to the vine, come be our leader. And the vine answered and said, no, not going to be your leader. Should I give up my wine, which cheers both gods and men to hold sway over the trees? Now, we're reading Scripture. We're reading Scripture. Yeah, this is, this this is, scripture. is not some story made up based on Scripture. This is, scripture. This is what the this is what Scripture, scripture says. says. Yeah. And so the trees of the field, and looking for a civil leader, they went to a great tree, the olive tree. They went to a great tree, the fig tree. They went to the vine, great plant. And all of them said, nah, too busy doing good stuff, too busy being productive, too busy blessing other people's lives, not going to do it. At that point, it says next, it says, and by the way, notice that all of, the, all of these, these trees had good reasons for not doing what they were doing. I mean, all of them had good reasons for not being, being involved and being a civil leader. But the next thing the scripture tells us is that so finally all the trees, having gone through all these possibilities, finally all the trees said to the thorn bush, 
And that ought to be an ominous sound all by itself. When you're having to go to the thorn bush and, and say, uh, we got to ask you, said, finally, all the trees said to the thorn bush, come be our leader. And wouldn't you know it, he's the one willing to be the leader. And so the thorn bush said, happy to. Uh, if you really want to anoint me leader over you, come and take a refuge in my shade. Um, I think we got a whole lot of thorn bushes what ruling right shade? now. shade? Yeah. There is no shade. <laughs> how, are you, how much fun is it to crawl up under a thorn bush? You know, t come take refuge under me. Ow, ow, ow. You know, you crawl under there and you get stuck everywhere You're you go. You're going to get stuck. And, and it's not fun. And there is no shade. And it's not very, you know, uh, so all of that. Uh, so the, the issue we got is we got a whole bunch of thorn bushes ruling. And, and we need to get rid of the thorn bushes. So how do you avoid thorn bushes? And the Bible gives us the answers on how to avoid thorn bushes because the Bible speaks very clearly. i, I got to emphasize in the, in the order of Genesis, and Genesis is called the seed plot of the Bible. There is not a doctrine we hold as Christians that does not come with this origin of the book of Genesis somewhere. And, and so when you look at Genesis, you have first Genesis 1 through 3, you have God creating the family, first institution. Starting in Genesis 9, he creates then government. That's the mm -hmm. second institution. And starting with the Genesis 32, he starts creating the church. So he created government before he created church, but he created after he created family, but it's clearly one of his big institutions. And why we would think that God would speak to church and family, but not to government is crazy. I mean, that's, he's got three institutions. He's not going to speak to these two and ignore this one when he created them. If he cares anything about the other two, he's got to do something you got to do something with this them. one. And that's why, you know, one of the books that our founding fathers used that we will refuse to read in class today is called The Two Treatises of Government by John Locke. And the reason we used to read it is because folks like Thomas Jefferson and Ben Franklin and, and John Witherspoon and, and, and Robert Trepain, so many guys who signed the Declaration said that that's the book they used to write the Declaration. So here we've got the document for the most successful government in the history of the world. 237 years we've been under the same piece of paper. Nobody else comes close to that. So we used to study that book in government class because we wanted to know what made America successful. We will not study today, and the reason is not because it's too long. It's less than an inch thick. It's less than 400 pages long. That book quotes the Bible over 1,500 times to show how governments to operate. Mm -hmm. Now, I was with a group of pastors a couple weeks ago, about 500 pastors. I said, how many verses can we think of that deal with government out of the Bible? Got less than 10 verses. There is a book that had more than 1,500. For some reason, we don't think the Bible talks to government. We think it talks to family and church. That little book alone had 1,500 verses, and that's not all the verses of the Bible on government. That's just the ones that that author chose and, and wrote on. So there's a lot there, and so that's why we can go back to the Bible and say, all right, how do you avoid thorn bushes? And, and the answer comes out of the, the Scripture in Exodus 18:21. It says, mm -hmm. choose out of all the people, able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covenants, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, rulers of tens. In other words, people, you have elections. You choose your local, county, state, and federal folks, and it gives the qualifications for office. I don't care whether they're dog catcher or president of the United States. They're supposed to be able men such as fear God, men of truth, hating covenants. That's the four qualifications that were put in the scriptures. That's what you look for all the way through. Hating covenants means I'm not going to take bribes and I don't even want the perks. I'm not getting in this office because I get travel expenses, because I get a salary, because I get a great retirement. I, I, don't, I don't want the perks. I leave all the perks out. I don't, I'm not doing it for that reason. Uh, I love truth, which means I don't have my own agenda. If you come to me and say, no, this is not the right thing, here's what truth is, and I'm willing to take off in your agenda if it's a truth agenda. And what happens, you get people in, in office now, they're agenda driven by their own agenda. Mm -hmm. They oh, want their oh, own big stuff. Time. Big they're, time. They're not after truth. I mean, we know from a truth standpoint uh, that so many public policies we do today harm physical health, they harm, they harm families, they harm uh, kids, and we do them because it's part of somebody's agenda. It's not because we love truth. So you get somebody in office who loves truth, they will do the right thing, even if it's not what they initially thought they were going to do. So you get able men, and by the way, you need to be competent. We get God-fearing people in office who are incompetent, it gives God a bad name. So you need to have competent people, able men who fear God, men of truth who hate covetousness. So you get those qualifications, that's what you want in office. Now what's interesting with that is you, you look at this choosing out. 
and choosing out, how did they do that? And, and in America particularly, how do we do the choosing out? And this is where it gets to be a, a, a lot of fun. When you're looking for the right kind of people to choose, where do you go? And, and I'm going to go to Ben Franklin because Ben Franklin told us from his reading of the Bible, here's who he saw that God chose out as leaders. And, and so here, here's what he tells us. He said, well, it's observable that God has often called men to places of dignity and honor. In other words, called them to office when they've been busy in the honest employment of their vocation, like these good fruit trees. They said, oh, I'm busy producing fruit. I'm busy producing wine or I'm busy producing figs. He said, God's called them when they've been busy in the employment of their vocation. He said, Saul was seeking his father's asses and David was keeping his father's sheep when they were called to the kingdom. The shepherds were feeding their flocks when they had their glorious revelation. He said, God called the four apostles from their fishery and Matthew from the street of custom, Amos from among the herdsmen of Tekoa, Moses from keeping Jethro's sheep, Gideon from the threshing floor. God never encourages idleness and he despises not persons in the meanest or lowliest employments. God's looking for people who are already busy doing something. And if you're busy doing something and busy doing productive, that's the one he wants to tap and put in office. Those are the people he puts mm -hmm. in office. And so the way we used to do that, the, the way we chose them out in America, and, and, and by the way, Sam Adams gives a lot of insight here. Uh, but what we did in America, you went into the voting booth, as we will do in a week or so in America, but you didn't have names on a ballot. You went in there with a blank piece of paper, and it said, Governor, City Council, Senate Rep, whatever. And, and I would say, oh, for Governor, I want Ken Copeland. And, and uh, you know, for, for a Mayor, I, I want Tim Fox. And I, you go through, you would write the names in. And then they would take all those ballots, they'd get together and count up all the names, and, and they'd come to you and say, hey, the people said they want you to be Governor. Are you going to be their Governor? And so what happened was you didn't put yourself forward, but people recognize leaders. They know they're leaders. If I have to tell you I'm your leader, we got trouble if mm, you don't know. That's true. And, and so here's what Sam yeah. Adams said. Sam Adams said it bodes very ill to government when men are exalted to places of a high trust through their own seeking to the office. If I'm putting myself forward for politics, he said he only fills a place with dignity who's invited to it by his fellow citizens from the experience they've had of his adequate abilities. He said, whoever interposes in elections with his own seeking of office for himself is to be feared that he will in time become a dangerous party man. He ought therefore to be despised and a intruder. People who put themselves forward who said, I'm the thorn bush, I would love to run. Those are the wrong guys. You want the people in office who don't want to run. And so if you look through the Bible, who was it that recruited Saul for office? It was the prophet Samuel. Mm -hmm. Who was it that recruited mm -hmm. David for office? It was the prophet Samuel. Who got, who got Solomon office as a prophet, Nathan? It used to be spiritual leaders would go after and said, you need to run for city council. We need you on the school board. Oh, you need to be on the water district. Why, didn't, why don't pastors and Christians do that anymore? We, we say, man, you, you've been so great with your family and in business. We need you over on whatever it is. And that's where we used to get the best candidates was Christians and particularly the church would recruit them because that's the biblical model. We've moved away from that. If we want to get back to where we're not hearing all this groaning, we've got to get back involved in actually recruiting. By the way, one other thing in closing this down, Benjamin Ross signed of the Declaration, taught kids in his school books that if people come to you and say, we want you to be our leader, you cannot say no because that's pure selfishness. If they recognize that they need you, they're asking you to serve. Will you serve? We need your help. Will you serve us? And if you say no, and he quoted from Romans 14, 7, where it says, no man lives and dies to himself. Yeah, not to himself. You're not here for your own purposes. Right. If you say no, you're being selfish. When they come to you and say, we need you on the school board, you can't say, no, I'm not going to run. You have to say, man, I'd like not to, but if I need to serve you on the school board, I'll serve now, you on the school board. if you have a man like that, they'll do the right thing. You have a woman like that, they're not interested in being in there 30 years. That's the ones you want. That's that, the ones you want. See, we're getting the thorn bushes because we refuse to go recruit or and we refuse to run. the thorn bush don't have any place else to go, so he wants to be there for 25, 30, 40 That's years. That's right. Build him a nest he can live in because ain't nobody wants He's him in the He's not productive with anything else. That's really the truth. It, you want the people it who are already busy. That. That's right. That's right. And, and we've got to change that from our standpoint. That needs to be a ministry of Christians is I'm going to run for office or I'm going to find people to run for office or the church is going to get involved in recruiting people for office because that's the way it historically and biblically had been. Powerful. Father, we receive your word. And our, our cry is for your help and yeah. your intervention in turning this around. Yeah. This is easy for you when we put forth our faith. Yeah. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brother David and I will be back in just a moment.
One of the things that I see as one of the biggest problems is that people get complacent about being involved in civil government, and they also get disenchanted, but really, aren't those just excuses for people not to get involved? We can all find an excuse for not doing something. When, when it comes to something as important as your nation and changing your nation, there is no excuse. Well, I think a lot of Christians, though, think that even if they vote, it doesn't make any difference. It does make a difference. It makes a difference to God, for one thing, because it's our duty to be involved, to be a good citizen. The forces of darkness, they never stop. They're, they're always working 24 hours a day. And even if, if we're resting, that means they're getting ahead of us. And that's what we can't allow them to do. God wants to heal this land. You know, He said in the Bible, that, you know, I, I want to heal your land, but He has to have vessels to work through, doesn't He? Right. If Christians will, first of all, pray in the U.S. or around the world, things will change. Of course, you can't just pray. If you have that right, if you have that ability to get involved and to vote, you have to do it. But most people, they don't want to call anybody and ask them their position on things. You know, that's too confrontational. We need to find out where people are coming from before we give them our vote. A vote is a precious thing. It's like what you were talking about earlier. It's a seed that we're planting in our communities and in our nation. We've all been told why America was founded, but we need to discover that truth for ourselves. Contrary to popular belief, our founding fathers were not all atheists and agnostics trying to keep the church out of government. Quite the contrary. They saw the Bible as a practical guidebook for directing every aspect of daily life and thus government, law, and education. The Bible is the chief moral cause of all that is good. The Bible the should be read in our schools. The Bible is a book all of which teaches man his own individual David Barton's book, Original Intent, was written as a result of years researching original documents from America's inception. With the appendix alone filling nearly a third of this book, he ensures that accuracy is intact. The influence of the Bible on America DVD documents the dramatic impact of the Bible on American life and culture. See historical records that prove God's hand in forming this country. Learn how many of our values stem from principles in God's Word. With these two products, you'll be equipped with the truth of this nation's founding. Discover the undeniable influence of the Bible on America. Discover the profound influence the Bible had on America's foundation. Order the Influence of the Bible package for $27.99 at a savings of 15%. Log on to kcm.org slash TV special and request your package today. Stand up for God's righteousness. Learn the true original intent behind the creation of our courts and constitution. For an additional 10% off, order the Influence of the Bible package online. It is a marvelous thing that we still have a country where David Barton and I can sit here and offer Jesus Christ of Nazareth to you as your Lord and Savior. Yeah. Amen. That's right. And we're going to keep it like That's that. That's right. Now, I'd do it anyway. I <laughs> would right. do it if they put me in prison for yeah. it, and then I'd preach it in the prison. That's right. And, I'd, and that happened, that's happening today in other countries all over this world. Yeah. Where people that I know mm -hmm. are in prison for preaching it, and they're winning souls in prison. Take uh, the, the the leaders of the underground church in China just met with the leaders of Congress. These three guys have been in over 60 years, and the, the congressman said, "Can we pray for you?" I said, "Yeah, but don't pray that we get out of jail." No, we went into the, Christ in jail, <laughs> yeah. and that was that was. I it. know people personally. They're doing that. That's right. And now. So those of you that have never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, don't go another second. Yeah. I mean, there is no life without Him. Well, Brother Colby, there may be many ways to get to God. Well, what do you want? Why do you want something other than the best? He's the best there is. And I'm telling you, He's so far beyond all yeah. the other choices that it just, it just casts a shadow over all the rest of it because He is the light. Hallelujah. Now listen to this. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the Scripture says, Whoever believes on Him shall not be ashamed. Hallelujah. Yeah. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
Pray with Brother David and me. Pray it out loud when you can hear it. <laughs> oh, God in heaven. Oh, God in heaven. I believe with all my heart. I believe with all my heart. That you raised Jesus from the dead. That you raised Jesus from the dead. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. I repent of sin. I repent of sin. I renounce the past. I renounce the past. And you're my future. And you're my future. Fill me, sir, yes. with your precious Holy Spirit. With your precious Holy Spirit. I receive him now. I receive him now. In Jesus' In name. Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Today's the beginning of your new life in Christ Jesus. Now, here's something I want you to do. If you prayed that with Brother David and me, I want you to let us know. Uh, use the information on your screen there and let us know about it because I want to send you this little book that gets you started reading your Bible. He did it all for you. And this little small brochure is all it takes to teach you how to study your Bible. You need to get in that and be strong in it. Praise God. Here's a very common question that I'm asked quite often and usually used as an excuse. How do I know who to vote for? What are the qualifiers? And it's a good question because I hear it a lot too, but you just have to do some research. I mean, really, what David Barton has said is that the most important thing is where they stand on life. That determines about 90% of where they're going to stand on everything else. And then something that's very timely is traditional marriage, moral law, and who they appoint. Because if they're going to appoint judges or magistrates or whatever that are ungodly, and then also public expression of religion. We were given rights by God mm -hmm. for all of these things. And it's government's job to protect those, yeah. not to take them away. Right. And if you don't take your values to the polls, mm -hmm. a lot of people, they believe the right way personally, mm -hmm. but when they go to the poll, they feel like they have to vote a different way. And you should never do that. You should always take your values Absolutely. with you to the polls. And, and I think people, they get it backwards. Well, I'm going to vote for the money. I'm going to vote for whoever's going to make it easier on my pocketbook. It's all connected. If yeah. you have morality, you're going to have economic prosperity. And you know, every election is important. Uh, there's no election where you can't use those four things that we talked about right. and, and not be correct. The one that's preeminent to me is if you don't value life, yeah. if you don't value life, then your entire value system is off. Right. Mm -hmm. If you just want to choose one, life. If they're right on life, they're going to be right on the money thing. And if you don't make a choice, a choice will be made right. for you. That's right. And that's exactly what's happening. If you're not voting, if you're not going and actually casting your ballot, a choice is being made for right. you. If you don't vote, you did. Mm -hmm. But you just didn't choose. Someone's going to make the choice. We're created in the image and likeness of God. Amen. We have the God-given ability to think like Him, talk like Him, see like Him, hear like Him and get his results. Amen. Come to a Kenneth Copeland Ministries event, the 2014 Washington, D.C. Victory Campaign, November 13th through 15th with Kenneth and Gloria Copeland at the Hilton Memorial Chapel in Woodbridge, Virginia. The 2015 Branson Victory Campaign, February 26th through 28th with Kenneth and Gloria Copeland at Faith Life Church in Branson, Missouri. The 2015 Southwest Believers Convention, June 29th through July 4th with Kenneth and Gloria Copeland and their special guests in Fort Worth, Texas. For more information, go to the KCM website. My name is Jeff Wright. I'm the director of the National Prayer Embassy here in Washington, D.C which is a division of our local church, which I also pastor, known as Victory World Outreach Church. In 1976, received the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues and enrolled in a Bible college that was being taught by some of the first year graduates of Kenneth Hagin's Rainbow Bible Training Center. And those people brought back all of Kenneth Copeland's audio teaching tapes at that time and uh, really encouraged us to listen to all of them. So I was instantly blessed by those in 83, God spoke to us about starting a church in Washington, D.C., primarily to pray for the government. I'd never been to Washington, D.C. before and really didn't have a large desire to come here ever, but God dropped it in my heart 
And so we found it was hard to forget to pray if we would go look at our leaders' offices on a regular weekly basis. We all know prayer is important. We all know that praying for the government is important. The Copelands and their team have done a great job of teaching us from 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4 that talk about not just making prayer, but supplication and prayer and intercession and giving and thanks. So I didn't know what else to do. I just took a group down to stand in front of the White House there on the South Lawn near where the helicopter lands every Sunday morning for about an hour. And then at one time we tried going from there and then we stood in front of the Capitol and then we'd go across the street to the Supreme Court. Then I discovered that you had to get a police permit for each of these locations that had to be renewed in person each week if you were gonna stand on that property in an organized way. We realized it was easier if we kept people on the van, we could cover more of the city faster, and I didn't have to go to all those police agencies to get those permits every week. Plus, we had a controlled environment away from the weather and the dogs and the tourists and the Frisbees. We could get some intensity in prayer, uh, and we had a, a comprehensive, systematic list of passing visual prayer reminders Kenneth started coming to this area on a regular basis in 1994. And I just had a tremendous fire in my heart to contact him, let him know what we've been doing with other ministries like Billy Brims and others, uh, offering these prayer tours with whatever vehicle was appropriate size. Uh, and so we made an announcement that first year. In fact, we <laughs> asked people to call an 800 number from the first uh, DC meeting that Kenneth held in 94. 200 people called the number and I only had planned on one bus, 60 passengers, so I spent the rest of the night <laughs> taking these messages off this recorder and scrambling around trying to find three more buses. We ended up taking a caravan of four buses through the city that year so we could all go at the same time. For over 30 years, Jeff Wright has faithfully served as a pastor in Washington, DC. Since that first meeting in 1994, KCM partners have connected with the vision of the National Prayer Embassy. And for the past 20 years, Jeff has organized and directed this annual journey of focused time and prayer for our nation, leaders, and world events. So as we're going by the White House, we'll pray a prayer from our handbook for the president. As we're going by the Pentagon, we'll pray a prayer from our handbook for the military. As we're going by the news media center here in DC, the museum, we'll pray a prayer for the news media. And then also we'll be using praise and worship as the Holy Spirit leads, including our powerful, familiar patriotic American songs that are all prayers set to music. Well, in 96, we adapted the prayer tour concept to Hollywood and began holding an annual Hollywood prayer tour from Kenneth's West Coast Believers Convention where we would pass the major movie and TV and radio and music centers there in Hollywood and use them as reminders to pray for godly values to prevail in the entertainment industry. Uh, the West Coast Believers meetings ended about 2009, and so since that time, we've linked up with a local church in Southern California who's caught the vision, and now they're taking a prayer tour of Hollywood every month. Other cities across America have caught the vision. We've done a number of tours, including uh, Tulsa and uh, my small hometown in Kansas, and then uh, New York City. When Brother Copeland went to New York City in 97, they, they allowed us to organize a prayer tour of that city. And so, of course, having Kenneth come every year for the last 20-some years has been the highlight of our year each year, seeing the people come together of like mind, like precious faith. My prayer is that God will just help me to be faithful, 1 Timothy chapter 1, so that he can continue to put me in the ministry. You know, we all get tired. Jesus got tired. But for the joy set before him, he endured the cross and despised the shame. And that's my goal, that I want to fight, finish, and keep the faith. So he can tell me when I get to heaven, well done, good and faithful servant. I know that's your goal too, and I so appreciate all that you're doing here to spread the gospel through this ministry. Now, David, you know, that's, that's a man that has had tremendous influence in this country, and no, nobody really uh, knows a whole lot about yeah. him as an individual. But man, it's an effect, undercurrent right. that has developed just because right. here's a guy that just was willing to be where he's supposed to he's be. He's a servant. And, and just do what God makes, tells him exactly to do. Right. And he just went and did what he's supposed to go and yeah. do. And it is a tremendous impact. Yeah. Amen. That's right. Now, Galatians chapter 6. Let him that is taught in the word 
respond to him that teaches in all good things. Now, Friday is always offering day on the Believer's Voice of Victory broadcast. But there's more to this scripture right here than just asking God uh, about sowing back and, and responding to the teacher. Because listen, let him taught, respond to him that teaches in all good things. And, and what David and I are saying to you today is there is a flood of revelation concerning this nation and its rebirth, praise God, to be greater than it's ever been before. Yeah. Yeah. that is available to people that will respond. Yeah, that's right. Amen. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man sows, that shall he also reap. He that sows to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life, or zoe, the very life essence of God. Amen. Now, Jesus said, when the sower sows the word, Satan comes immediately to steal the word which was sown. Now, if, and there's no question, he does that. Mm -hmm. But if you will immediately sow and release back into the operation of ministry that uh, from whom you received revelation, that's when the revelation takes root in your spirit and the devil can't steal it. Mm -hmm. It's an extremely important thing. Yeah. And Father, we pray right now for our partners, yeah. everyone in the sound of our voice. Reveal to them, sir, their part of this ministry, how they should communicate and respond and react through your word and how they should sow and we receive and we release our faith and we release the anointing of increase, the very life of God, spirit and soul and financially and whew, glory to God, socially strong, spirit, soul, body, yeah. finance yeah. in every area as a nation yeah. and as citizens of our nations throughout the earth. We thank you for it, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, partners. If you missed any of these broadcasts, go to kcm.org and, and you can get it there and, do, and watch it again. Go to church this weekend. We'll see you Monday. Until then, this is Kenneth and David reminding you again that Jesus, Jesus is Lord. Lord. Thank you for joining us today on the Believer's Voice of Victory. For this week's broadcasts on DVD or MP3 on CD, go to kcm.org or call or write to us today. Remember this week's product offer. These ministry tools are designed to help you get the Word working in your life so you can experience all God has for you. If you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, be sure to request your free salvation package. This will help you understand who you are in Christ and how to start living your new life in victory.